Bulan prezentasyonu var. Prezentasyon buradan geldi. Can you hear us now? Hello. Yeah, is it working, Jeff? I'm speaking now. Let me know if it works. Can you hear me? I'm speaking now. Can you hear me? I don't think so. Chef, can you hear us? I don't know. Why. Uh, can you tell uh, him to the disconnect and connect again? Problem or problem was a dear man. You are just sorry, good for us. You are not son of the other. You are Webex or Skype? Webex, Webex. Webex. Because if, if you will connect to Skype, we can able to, to hear. It doesn't work via Skype. Huh? It doesn't work via Skype. Oh, I don't know exactly. Because if you will call uh, by by Skype, we can hear him. But if you will uh, connect uh, Skype to Skype, we can. Okay, can. so it's dialing via Skype yes, yes, or if, Webex? If, yes, it's dialing via Skype, no problem. You said we have two uh, panelists here. Yeah, the other one uh, will dial in, yeah. but I don't know when. Ah, oh. mm -hmm. So what is wrong? Uh, Jeff, uh, can you hear me? Just hearing loud scratching. It kind of seems to uh, Jeff. Can you hear me clearly?
No, I don't know, but I see. Hello, hello. You hear me? I can't hear myself. That's okay. Which channel it is? That's okay if you don't I hear can't, yourself. I can't hear anything. You it doesn't work. Hmm? Okay, I'm getting... So it's a test, test. Do you hear me? Yeah, it works. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Is it not working? Yeah, welchen brauchen wir denn? Linda? I think it's channel three. It's channel three, you said. Yeah. Try. Is it working now? Can you hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. It's not working yet with Jeff Jarvis, but we're, we're trying to fix it with Jeff Jarvis. Good morning, everyone. We are on channel three. So I think we are complete, so we can start. Let me welcome you, everyone, to uh, this morning to the workshop um, Rethinking Copyright. Can we develop a set of common principles? Which is a um, workshop, I think it's of uh, broad interest to everyone here. And I thank you very much, especially um, to the guests and to the participants we've invited to that wor workshop. First of all, I would like to welcome you, Mr. Winton Cerf, Vice President and Chief Inter Internet Evangelist of Google and being known as one of the fathers of the internet. Welcome, Windsurf. Um, I hopefully will welcome Mr. Richard Stellman, president of the Free Software Foundation and known as one of the fathers of free software. Um, he is uh, not here in Baku, but he will hopefully remotely uh, participate by uh, uh, telephone because um, he refused to use the video conferencing system because it's not free software, <laughs> <laughs> which I really like about him. <laughs> Hopefully, we will call in um, in the next couple of minutes. I'd also like to welcome Mr. Trevor Clark, um, Assistant Director General, of Culture and Creative uh, Industry, the WIPO. Welcome. Um, I'd like to welcome Mr. Carmen Imanov, Chairman and President of the Copyright Office of Azerbaijan, and I'm very proud that we have um, well, a local on the panel. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'd like to uh, welcome Mrs. Uh, Deborah Kulabako uh, of the Diplo Foundation, Uganda, who's not here yet, I think. Okay. And I'd like to welcome uh, Mr. Jeff Jarvis, a journalist and also well-known worldwide. 
He will uh, remotely participate uh, by video conferencing. He is online, as I uh, heard already. Um, he was trying to come to Baku, but uh, he was, uh, well, a um, uh, victim of uh, Sandy. He was able to fly here, and uh, his house was flooded, and, um, <laughs> and he was uh, looking, he, he, I think he moved to a hotel, so he has uh, power and electricity and internet. Hopefully, this will work. And I'd like to welcome Mr. Cra Chris uh, Marsic. Um, of the Motion Picture Association. Welcome. Um, well, um, the um, copyright discussion um, has been uh, since uh, the early days of uh, digitalization and global connectivity at the internet has been uh, more and more an important discussion. Not only if you, uh, that because every content which can be digitalized can be reproduced uh, very easily and spread all over the world, um, but um, also the different systems of rights worldwide as the copyright in the US, for example, or the Urheberrecht in Germany are completely different systems. We have to deal on an international basis how we will cope with those problems occurring with the, well, misuse of copyright. Discussing how such principles the new we have to develop could be legally enforced. In recent time, there have been various new initiatives that attempt to internationally regulate international property rights. Initiatives such as SOPA, PIPA, and ACTA have demonstrated the difficulties of obtaining the correct balance between protecting intellectual properties, property rights and preserving the openness of the Internet. So, I'd like to just jump in with a quite offense uh, question. Um, what if you could, participants, forget everything you know about intellectual property, property and copyright and ignore all existing laws and rules? Um, take a white paper and develop a perfect idea of how we should treat this issue. And so I'd like to start with you. When and uh, see what you will write on the white paper. Well, thank you very much for an opportunity to uh, express my opinion. Uh, first of all, I would not for a moment suggest this is perfect, but I would like to make some observations about the way in which uh, intellectual property has oh. been treated uh, in the last oh. 30 years or so. Uh, one of the most important conventions is called the Berne Convention. And in 1976, it was adopted in the United States, but I think it was around before that uh, elsewhere. And one of its provisions says that when you create uh, something, that you are uh, the owner of the all rights of that work. Uh, you don't have to go and register that uh, in order to demonstrate that you have uh, the rights. The uh, interesting, uh, I, I can see why this is very attractive because uh, registering something takes time and you have to go through some process. Uh, not having to register it looks attractive on the surface. But I have to say that looking uh, back now over uh, a 35 year period, one of the problems of not registering things is that no one else can figure out who has what rights. Uh, we encounter this at, at, uh, at Google, especially in the context of uh, printed works that are no longer in print trying to understand who has what rights and, and uh, how do we uh, find a way to clear them turns out to be quite difficult. So uh, one thought that I would include oh, wow. in this white paper would be uh, to reintroduce the notion of registration. It should be easier to do oh, wow. in digital with digital works oh, wow. because they can be transmitted uh, for registration purposes. At the same time that you do that, you can imagine making assertions about that uh, work with regard to what terms and conditions you would be willing to um, uh, treat uh, use of that work, and there might be a variety of different uses. In the case of books, there are such things as movie rights, and there are such things as uh, translation rights, and I'm no expert, you understand, but there are a variety of different kinds of rights associated with works. You can imagine in the process of registering, you could identify under what terms and conditions you would be willing to negotiate the use of some of those uh, rights. Uh, the other thing that uh, could be done is that if it's a digital object, it could be digitally signed. 
and the consequence of doing that is to preserve the integrity of the of the digital instance of the work that has been registered. So if another work comes along, it's not hard to figure out whether it's the same copy by simply verifying the digital signature. Another element that's missing uh, from the, as I understand it, and I'm happy to be corrected by experts, uh, another thing that's missing from intellectual property management is the registration of transfers of rights. In real property, it's very common when an exchange is to be made when you're acquiring a piece of property, that, that transaction is registered, usually in a public uh, document. Uh, this is very beneficial because if you are, uh, if you are the recipient of a, a piece of real property, you would like to be assured that what you are acquiring uh, has all the appropriate rights that you're paying for. It's possible to research that because of the regime of recording transactions and transfers. We don't typically, typically do this with intellectual property, and once again, it's hard to find out what has happened to the rights of, an, of a, a work uh, over a period of time. Um, I don't mean to go on and on because there are other important views to be heard, but that's an example of the kind of regime which I think would be beneficial, especially in an online environment. Hello. Thank, thank you very much. And, um, I'd like to go on with, uh, with Mr. Trevor Clark. What do you think? What should be on the white paper after you've made the point? <coughs> Thank you. Um, my white paper will start with Vint Cerf <coughs> at the top because his, his point was one of the points that, <coughs> that I have, have on my list. Um, but let me say that I, I do agree, as most people think that there is a need for the copyright system to be revisited. Um, I think the system relies too heavily on the law and not only is the law cumbersome but the law is very slow and in an internet environment where the technology is stimulating such rapid changes in the way business is done to rely on the law alone is an unfortunate situation, um, especially when the law is as complex as copyright law seems to be. Um, people say that the, the, the copyright law was developed by lawyers for lawyers. Now we have, we have created this thing called the internet, which is putting copyright content at the disposal of the average citizen. Hello. And this is now billions of people around the world, I think it is Hello. two billion, almost three billion, um, are able to access content on the internet. And most of these people don't know what copyright is. <laughs> they don't oh, care yeah. what it is. <laughs> they just know that there's a song or a movie there that they, they want to see. Um, and then we get the problem complicated where several countries have made laws that criminalizes some of these activities on the internet um, and it's it's unfortunate that the the main not the main targets but clearly the people who do most of the illegal downloading are very young people very innocent um, to this so-called crime that they are committing and therefore we have begun to advocate the need for some education, some cultural change um, to help people, particularly young people, to understand the environment in which this internet uh, and copyright is operating. Um, so yes, like Mr. Cerf, we think that the Mandatory registration of rights of ownership is something that is, is critical. And it's amazing that an increasing number of countries are beginning to implement voluntary registration systems. I think the United States have for, has for decades um, been encouraging, and they have a legal means of encouraging voluntary registration, but a lot of developing countries also are, are moving in, in this direction. And it makes such, such good sense. Um, the, 
the international framework for copyright law derives from treaties that are negotiated amongst member states. And these treaties do have some principles um, which largely identify minimum standards and minimum levels of behavior. And I think that's the only way you can get international agreement uh, these days and for decades going back if the, the principles are broad enough to be acceptable in different jurisdictions. So yes, we can speak about the principles that are already there. And of course, we can speak uh, like Vint about um, new principles that, that should be taken into consideration. Now, the Director General of the organization that I have the honor to represent, that is the World Inter Intellectual Property Organization, has added his voice to the call for global reflection on the state of, the co of copyright. It is important that I put this on the table because even though the mandate of WIPO, WIPO, is the protection of intellectual property around the world, we recognize that particularly with copyright in the digital environment, that there needs to be some changes. Now that's a view of the Director General and a view of the Secretariat. Of course, we, are, we, are, we have to submit ourselves to the views of member states. And member states have conflicting views on this issue. There is, there is no cohesion in these ideas. We do have an opportunity now through some negotiations taking place in Geneva, focus on the questions of exceptions to copyright, well, where three, people are beginning three, to understand four, the, the different arguments that are brought to bear, not only in the area of music, but film and also um, um, publishing and a very critical area of these exceptions that are being considered is exceptions to facilitate the blind, to, accept, to facilitate the, the sharing of information in a format that's accessible to the blind. And that requires a change in the principles, one of the principles embedded in, the, in, in treaties and in, in, in copyright law. Um, I have some other points, but I, I think I'll, I'll leave like that and, and come back and follow up as necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Clark. We uh, continue with uh, Mr. Carmen Imanov, and I'd like to know what is the Azerbaijan uh, view um, on the white paper of copyright. I thank you, the moderator, for giving an opportunity to make a speech and my colleagues panelists for their previous presentations. I am representing interest of copyright law society, what that uh, which is to find common language with internet. For this reason, the topic of my presentation is copyright at internet, clash of internet interest and compromise search. That do we have in traditional environment. Pay taking into account that traditional copyright is compromise between exclusive right of right holders and interest of users. It is social contract, right holders society. The important principle stand of the basis of the exclusive rights. Exclusive rights restraining mechanism as analogous of property. What is protected by copyright? Copyright protects the form of objectively expressed creative results, artistic expression or works. That too we have in Internet. Support the balance. Development of exclusive right. For example, WIPO Internet Treaty, VCT, VPPT. For right holder, here use it, right of communication to the public, including right to making available to the public and short interactive public communication. Our internet, we are not dealing with work, but with content, the circulation of which creates a new contents. Content is 
informative significance of contents. Form is container to fill the content. Content as information nature. Copyright is the regulation of disclosed public information at the same time. Right of information regulates information with limited access. Secondly, content circulation creates new kinds of creativity, new forms, fragmentation, mixing, mashups, digital sampling, animation, etc. Consequences of new form of creativity, losing of oneness, integrity, and static character, acquisition, plurality, disability, and dynamic character of works form. Let's make conclusion. The term content is strengthening of content's significance and weakening of significance of digitized works form, including infinite cloning, replication, and division of the same information contents. And his is modification of form. The new adapted form of the object of copyright or new object of copyright. So, form as a legally important characteristic of op uh, copyright in the material world works weakly in digital space. Secondly, the fact is that exclusive rights are may or may not. Prohibitive function, prohibition on the use, authority, ownership in material world does not work. Why? What are the reasons? We are also supporters of view. Information behaves differently than the object of material words because it obeys the principle of free distribution and use of public information. Law of value does not work. Information is endless resource, the value of which increases with the prevalence but the cast of material object is higher than in scarcer and more labor spent on its creation. So, how to find a balance of interest, consumers, users, right holders and authors? The international community, community has accumulated uh, practice of internet copyright, technique enforcement, uh, acta, etc., model focusity, of the preservation of traditional copyright, strengthening and restraining mechanism of exclusive right, removal of limitation of the free use work, including compulsory license and statutory license, license by law, Creative Commons, Copyleft, Fisher, Dolgin, Kozerio, Budnik, etc. models, models focused on internet access, authorization mechanism of exclusive rights. The latest uh, model differ by system of comp compensation to right holders, starting from the right of equitable remuneration and finishing with the absence. For now this is all, the rest I will say later, if it will possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Emanov, um, I'd like, do we have a chance to get Jeff Jarvis online right now? He, hmm? he is on, he's online, we just need two more minutes. Okay, so we will continue maybe with Mr. Marsic. Please, if you could uh, state one, uh, what you want on the white paper. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Uh, yes, we have Jeff. No, oh. Do you want to give, okay. you need him? No? <coughs> I think I, I would start from the point of view that uh, copyright has in fact been pretty, uh, pretty adaptable uh, to change. It has uh, not impeded uh, the internet boom, quite the contrary. Uh, all, of, all of the data, all of the facts out there speak, speak to, to that uh, proposition. Uh, and it has not prevented alternative models such as the Creative Commons from establishing themselves and, and functioning in, in their own manner. Um, for us, the, the sort of copyright that we're talking about is, is, is fundamental to a dynamic creative uh, sector that is innovative, that contributes to, uh, to jobs and to, to the economy in, in, in very important ways. 
And so, you know, changing a formula that has worked would require a justification, would require evidence. And right now, uh, I don't think the case has been made. Uh, and if a review there is to be, whether within the WIPO or at uh, the EU level or, or elsewhere at the national levels, I think that those, those reviews uh, would need to take up a full range of issues. They shouldn't be, they would not necessarily need to be limited to copyright alone as we understand it based on, uh, on treaties and law. Um, there's a whole broader question of, of internet governance, in fact, uh, who establishes the rules, um, where, where do elected governments fit in, uh, and, you know, to what extent is, you know, is it appropriate that the uh, decision-making powers for governance should be delegated to private companies. Um, are liability privileges doing what they were supposed to do in, a, in, terms, of, in terms of copyright? Uh, has enforcement been effective, and if not, why not? Now, there are undoubtedly uh, areas where one could make improvements, where, where changes could be justified. Uh, it, may, it may well be that the idea of a, uh, of a register of the sort that Mr. Cerf has um, floated and that is gaining uh, popularity in, in, in Geneva, in Moscow, in London, uh, elsewhere possibly, uh, could, could be a facilitating tool. I don't know, but that would have to be done uh, w with a lot of care and, and looking at what would be done. Is it a works register, rights register? How far would it go? Um, so if you create a register uh, that is not dynamic enough itself, it impedes the dynamic functioning of the rights model that exists right now. Because rights, in fact, are dynamic. They move. One, two, three, they, four, they're five. traded. Uh, they cover specific activities and so forth. So uh, the question is whether that, that could actually function. In the U.S., they have uh, a, a, what is now a voluntary register, which used to be de facto required, actually. And they moved away from requiring it because it imposed burdens uh, on non-national registrants, for one, and because it's not as flexible as, or at least at the, that model, probably was not as flexible uh, as it might have been had it been, uh, or, and maybe today's technology can help with that. Uh, it, and and it, it, it could well be that that whole issue needs to be looked at. We certainly are going to participate constructively in, in uh, whatever reviews are taking place in a, in a serene environment, in, a, in an informed environment. Uh, and, you know, starting with a clean sheet of paper would be interesting, uh, and, and maybe we should do that exercise from time to time just as a reality check. But the reality also is that we have a body of law, I'm no lawyer, um, but I've, I hear a lot of lawyers talking a lot about it, that has, has a, lot of, uh, a, a lot built into it already, and a lot of the system that's out there is, is tied into it. So uh, the clean sheet exercise can help us maybe look, see where we would make changes uh, if, uh, if there were opportunities to do so. And one area, as our colleague from WIPO has said, is, is, is that is being looked at is the area of exceptions, whether those are, are uh, suited to, to the present environment. And we're certainly participating <coughs> in that exercise uh, to, to, look at the, you know, to look at those exceptions and, and see uh, how, they, how they work. Uh, and in particular with respect to the blind, where uh, I think everyone agrees the, the rules need to facilitate access to, um, to content and other, other services uh, maximally. So I would, I, I'll stop there. I'd be happy to intervene again and uh, participate in the discussion. But effectively, I think my bottom line is that the current, Hello, the current one, two, system three, four, has five. worked. It has delivered for the internet. One, it has two, delivered three, four, for, for the creative content sector. One, two, and before three. making wholesale changes, I would want to be one, sure two, that three. those changes were carefully considered and were truly evidence-based and not one, based two, on, three, four, uh, on ideology one, two, three, four, or five. facile truisms. Thank you. Thank you very much. So I hope we can get Jeff Jarvis now on, on the panel. So, Jeff, can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can everyone hear yeah. Jeff Jarvis? I think so. So may, maybe you speak a little bit up because I, yes. we are very... Um, yeah. I, I will speak up. Okay. Um, I apologize for not being there. The, uh, the hurricane that hit the East Coast uh, kept me here. Are you hearing me or no? I hear you. See yeah, you I, I can hear you. We can hear you. Great. Okay. I want to make just a few points. Um, 
First, I'd like to complicate things by saying that perhaps the model is not about content. I think we're operating in Gutenberg era uh, rules here, and as uh, some social scientists at the University of Southern Denmark have said, we're on the other side of the Gutenberg parenthesis, that perhaps we are thinking too much in the form of products and content, when in fact we have new models today. Uh, content has value, certainly, but it has value in new ways. For example, Facebook and Google use content to uh, get us to generate signals about ourselves, who we are interested in, what we want to know, and what we do know, and who has authority, and things like that. And that value is great, uh, but it is not in the form of paying for content in the old way. So in this new structure, in this new media can have value is relationships among people and data about them. And in that kind of new economy, then uh, just trying to protect content for sale may not be the right thing. And I, I, I wrote about something called, uh, not copyrights, but credit. If for this money by giving talks, uh, or by uh, selling other products, uh, then that author uh, needs credit for his or her work. He needs the link to him. And in that, uh, he gains value. And so it's not just about saying that I have created a product and I'm going to sell that product. In the internet, in a world of links, uh, in the web rather, in a world of links, uh, things pass around quite a bit. And what we need is credit for them, provenance links back to us. I'll give you one quick example. There's a company called Repost to become repostable, embeddable, traveling around the internet with brand, advertising, analytics, and links. So now rather than trying to make everyone come to your content and pay for your content there, now your content can travel around the net. And so what you need in that case is the provenance of the links. So I think we're trying to reestablish a Gutenberg era uh, content structure onto a new technology where the economy is not even clear. One other point, I am on the board of a company called Learning Ally, uh, formerly called Recording for the Blind. And the access is not just for the blind. Access is also important for people who have dyslexia and other reading issues and who learn differently. And so we need a structure by which content is indeed put up in uh, standard form formats so that it can be used by various people through various means. So what I would urge here is not just to try to recreate the textual Gutenberg print era of content being value in and of itself. There is also value in creating an audience for that content. There is also value in the aggregation of that content into a larger data set. There's value around that content, that information, that interaction and conversation in other ways. And I know this is inconvenient to listen to me this way, so I'll end that there. Jeff, thank you, thank very much. Um, interesting, interesting ideas you had. Um, and I heard we have uh, Richard Salmon on the phone. No, we don't. Garnt? No, we haven't. So, um, maybe I'd like to open the discussion right now. Um, do you want to maybe interact between the participants? Have you, um, I saw you made a lot of notes, so maybe you want to start um, commenting on your, uh, uh, part, uh, the other participants. Well, first of all, I found all of the comments uh, very thought-provoking, and that's the purpose of uh, this kind of a meeting. Uh, to start with uh, Jeff Jarvis observation, I think that's a very uh, innovative and different view of uh, the utility of, uh, of content. Uh, Jeff, uh, John Perry Barlow, uh, uh, who, was the, who wrote the lyrics for The Grateful Dead, uh, once observed that he was less interested in being paid for the song that was being played rather than uh, he'd rather play those songs for free and have people pay for the next song that's going to be done. Uh, in possibly in performance, for example. So I think Jeff's, Jeff's points are, are very thought-provoking because they take us away from even the model I was suggesting, which is 
uh, I, I have to say, a much more Gutenberg-like uh, perspective. Uh, I'm not even sure how we would codify the kinds of uh, rights associated with the concepts that, uh, that Jeff has just uh, introduced. That's not a criticism, but it certainly is a challenge. Um, I would like to respond to uh, MPA for just a moment. Uh, he's, uh, I'm sorry, your name is? Chris. Chris, Chris is, is correct that uh, copyright has adapted pretty dramatically from the time that uh, it uh, existed, uh, was, uh, w the notion was created. Certainly from the U.S. perspective, uh, where we see copyright notions showing up in very early documents of the country, uh, well before the invention of movies, for example, or uh, cameras and so on. So it's clear that there has been adaptation. Uh, I have to confess to you, though, uh, an opinion that I hold, uh, which is that somehow the notion of control over information has overwhelmed the other side of the equation, which I thought was to grant rights to the creator of works for a fixed period of time after which the work would become available in the public domain to the rest of the population. And the, although I know you're not a lawyer, so I won't blame you for this, the extension of rights to 75 years past the end of the life of a, of a creator or author uh, and the uh, inhibitions on sharing of that information have damaged, in some sense, the fundamental theory behind copyright as I understood it, and I think we need to redress that somehow. Uh, so I, I'll leave it there for now. There's lots more to be said, I'm sure. So, um, Chris, do you want to react directly on that? Why not? Yes, of course. I, I think, um, you know, well, first of all, I, a lot of interesting remarks were made. I think that uh, that the comments by Jeff on, on credit or uh, almost a barter type model are interesting insofar as they go. It, these, these ideas uh, could have uh, some application to certain, um, certain types of content in any case to the extent that the creators of that content are interested in, in that sort of a credit or barter or whatever model you want to call it. Um, that said, there are creators of other forms of content who have other ideas and have uh, other other levels of investment in the content which is being exploited, which need to be taken into account. I mean, one one tends to have these discussions in a, in a sort of an abstract way, and 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 talk about uh, you know sort of a, almost a one size fits all world, where in fact that is not the case. Uh, if a musician would like to have uh, to apply a certain model to to her creation, uh, so be it. They don't need to insist on the protections of copyright uh, if they will move to another, if they wish as a creator to move to another model. Um, they, they can and some have tried to use other models. Um, but the, the, the notion of property rights, which underlie uh, copyright is there. Uh, most property rights are, are, are permanent. Copyright is a limited grant of, of rights, I guess. Uh, not being a lawyer, I won't try to expand on that, but it is a limited grant, that much I know, which has been extended. The term of copyright has been extended o over time. Um, but I'm not, it, it's not convincing to me that the, this grant of rights needs to be expropriated at a certain point in time, uh, especially for certain types of works. I mean, you, you know, th there are certain works that may be more necessary to society to have them available or to have them available to certain um, disadvantaged elements of society. But as a general proposition, I'm not convinced that that point is, uh, is correct. Thank you. Here, you and I part. And, and we part almost on the basis of a constitutional observation that the purpose behind copyright as adopted, at least in the United States, was precisely to benefit the general public uh, after, <coughs> after the party creating the work had had exclusive benefit for it. So here, you and I absolutely disagree. Uh, however, there was something else you said, which, uh, two things that you said, which I think are quite important. One of them is that uh, the creator of a work should have the choice of how that work is treated. And so the Creative Commons is an example of an, at of an attempt to open the spectrum up from the rigid uh, current treatment of copyright so this, this is an important thing to open the spectrum and give more control to the creators of these works. Uh, when you said that you don't have to adopt 
the uh, strict rules of copyright. This is a, a factual statement. I'm not disagreeing with that. But the difficulty today is that it's rather hard to ex extract yourself from that regime. You know, where do you go to say, I actually want this work to be public domain, or I want this work to be uh, available under other kinds of terms and conditions? Now, adopting Creative Commons is an example of that, but I think the regime is is only loosely coupled right now. So making it easier for someone to make the assertion, here is how I wish the work to be treated, uh, is in fact an important thing for us to include in the white paper. Thank you very much. And um, I'd like to know, um, uh, Mr. Clark, what do you think on, uh, of the ideas of uh, Jeff Jarvis? So I think I think the the idea of rethinking copyright sometimes we focus too much on the law because copyright is not only about the law. So in in considering rethinking the copyright system, we need to take into consideration yes there are issues with the law that's complex and difficult and restrictive, etc. But this, this many aspects of the copyright law has benefited society for, for many years and we don't want to throw the baby out with the bath water. Of course, we want to take your language. Um, any change should be justified and based on evidence. And in order to pursue change, we need to have this kind of dialogue. And I don't remember if it was here or uh, an earlier discussion, um, this multi-stakeholder environment is the, the best and most appropriate environment for these issues to be discussed. And I hope that, that there are members or representatives of governments also participating in, in this, this dialogue. Um, copyright has increasingly become of greater economic value to society. And we all who use the content have to recognize that there is an economic value and that someone has put some blood, sweat, and tears into producing this content and that that person should be rewarded in some way if he or she wants to be rewarded because there are lots of creators who do this thing for the love of it. and and that is a great contribution to culture in that country, those countries, culture. So this earlier this morning, I spoke of the importance of balance, balancing the economics with the social and cultural aspects. Um, these three things need to be understood and need to be put into the equation when we want to reconsider or to consider um, the copyright system. Um, and I need to stress that when I reported that the Director General of the World Intellectual Property Organization has added his voice to this call for a, a review or re-examination, re it is of the copyright system not just the copyright law. Uh, and he does not shy away from the fact that some aspects of the law needs to be revisited. But it isn't a question of throwing out everything that has been established there. And as Chris said, have served us well over many decades. Um, but that's what re-examination is about in the, in the light of new information it is foolish not to reconsider your position. What the internet is forcing us to do is to do this on a global basis. One of the unfortunate, maybe not unfortunate, but one of the principles of copyright that needs to be revisited is this question of territoriality. I should say one of the principles of intellectual property is this territoriality. Um, we are experiencing the difficulties that the players on all sides of the equation are having with 
the law being territorial, but the internet is global. And that's one of the things that we need to put on the on this sheet of paper that should not be clean. It should bring forward the good from the past and see what we can add to make it better in the future. And uh, to continue that global discussion, I think Jeff Jarvis is on, on the line and wants to add something. Uh, yes, I would. Jeff, um, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can. <laughs> uh, answering Vint Cerf's challenge for codification of this, uh, the, the, the honest answer, of course, is I don't know. But I think that let's consider a few things here, is resist the nature and flow of the Internet. And it's going to be very hard to build businesses and extract value around that. What I'm challenging is the idea that we should find the ways to go with the flow of the Internet, quite literally. Imagine if a more on the net with monetization and uh, analytics and links back attached to it. Imagine if we made money every time someone shared our work then we would eagerly have it shared. That's the way the internet operates, and we need the technology and business models to go along with that. Um, so I think the first thing is a technology, and, and I mentioned one example is this uh, company that does repost.us for article. Jeff, it's Vince Surf. You're dropping out from time to time, so we're losing some of your speech. Can you hear us now? Okay. Shows I you how crappy the telephone system is. <laughs> internet is better. <laughs> well, I think it's over the internet, isn't it? So, um, yeah, we, we, we lost Jeff Jarvis, but he, I think he made his point um, understandable. Um, yeah, um, I think to be, uh, do you want do you want to add something to the whole issue or? Hmm? Okay. Balance of interests of consumers, authors, and right holders. Their interests are not necessarily antagonistic. There are much more interest. Search for compromise leads on the facts. First, one can use of mathematical model of game of three parties, which which made that interest and which allow any coalitions. It is voting model in the choice of the three project. Project A, free use of IP objects on the internet or introduction exceptions to copyright for the internet, conditionally free use. Project B, free use of IP object on the internet with the right of remuneration or introduction of addi additional limitation to copyright of the internet, conditionally compulsory license use. Project C, patenting of uh, requirements for use of objects on the internet or development of exclusive right and additional sanction of enforcement, etc., conditionally patenting use. Free projects. This is game. Game. No antagonistic. We analyze it for four variants of the system preference parties. Case of unanimous voting for each of the project. We selected from them uh, shows which provide strong of coalition equilibrium. The conclusion or the analysis are strong equilibrium in favor of the tightening use was obtained in two cases of concurrence of the preferences of authors and the rights holders and does not depend on the preference of the consumers in favor of free use or compulsory use. Strong equilibrium in favor of the compulsory use can be reached reach in case of mismatch of the preference of the authors and right holders, and does not depend on preferences of the users in favor of free use and compulsory use. There is not strong equilibrium in favor of free use. 
the most realistic and interesting case is then the system of preference is different right holders for tightening use user for free use others for compulsory use in this case the strong equilibrium is the favor of compulsory use the result priority of action project compulsory use then tightening use and then free use it owns it it is only the prior uh, priority and is does not exclude any possible of the use of object the following we recommended replacing restricted function to the positive permissive function of the content with the right for remuneration compulsory license source uh, sources collection rule and distribution and uh, remuneration may be different in particular the issues can be solved by collective management but which the mandatory or not mandatory condition of uh, registration of works as an analogous of use of work on the TV and radio. Thank you very much. I heard Richard's, Richard Salman is on the phone. So Richard, can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can't hear you. Hmm. Richard? Um, I don't think it worked. So we're, we're trying, but I... <coughs> Alex, Alex did something that his hand does. I didn't know what he wanted to bring hmm? in. Alex is on the other side there. I didn't yeah. know if you wanted to bring in the rest of the audience. Alex yeah. had his hand up. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, what, what, what is Richard? Okay, and? He's off. Okay, so that's maybe a good idea and a good point of uh, discussion where we... Um, well, have the uh, good multi-stakeholder international aspect of the whole um, workshop and get into uh, the public discussion and open it to uh, the audience. I've had several fingers up, raised up. So, you, uh, do you have a do we have a microphone? For yeah, yeah. here, there it is. So we've got the first participant here. Thank you very much. Good morning. Can you hear me? Um, this is Radio IGF speaking to you. <laughs> if, if, once you take the microphone, you'll realize that this is exactly like speaking in a radio station uh, because you don't actually see people hearing you. Uh, my name is Alejandro Pisanti. I'm from the National University of Mexico and the uh, Internet Society chapter in Mexico. Uh, I'm very impressed with uh, Professor Karamanov's uh, non-zero-sum games. I've been advocating for this in a paper that's out for about a year and a half on the net, but without the mathematical uh, modeling, which I think is admirable. Uh, I think that uh, what we have heard from the MPAA representative from uh, is uh, is one-sided. Surprised here you use the one uh, for the uh, uh, one side. I will try to speak more slowly, stay away from static uh, interference. I will go to the mixer and see. Can you hear me better from here? Okay. Does 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 this function better from here? Let's uh so I I don't want to take a lot of time. Uh the non-zero sum games are possible, and they are very important. Uh, as has been said by other speakers and by uh, Trevor Clark in particular, a lot of creators of content which is valuable for society ha either are not working for specific profit from their present works ha or have already been paid for their work or consider their income satisfactory. And they're not pushing for, uh, they, 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 they have to be able to free themselves from the distorted model that uh, one specific way of making commerce with intellectual products uh, is imposed on society at a very high cost. People are sharing and will continue sharing. The only statistic I believe that comes from the content industry is that 95% of the music and films that are being seen or listened to 
are not uh, uh, authorized copies. And you're not going to stop that uh, avalanche by trying to uh, reinforce the grids of the present legal prosecution system. It, this needs change. One of the ways that this change can be effective in practice is uh, accelerating public dominion uh, access to works, uh, making easy, as has already been said, to share. Universities and other content providers should not think that their impact is achieved once you have a publication. The impact is achieved once that publication is in the hands of people who can do something with it. Uh, so models like confining uh, knowledge produced by society with public funds uh, into entities like JSTOR uh, cannot, cannot continue. This, uh, this, this is actually self-limiting the access to uh, the, the, the impact of knowledge. And uh, entities like universities, I'll go that now in particular in, in, in the universities, hospitals, industry, etc., who produce knowledge uh, that is published, can do things to change very fast, which is basically supporting their authors going to open access. Uh, we know that that will also have a cost, the, but there's first a barrier to move for the move to open access, uh, which is the loss of points of bonus points of salary points for the authors in, in, in institutions. Uh, budgets can be redirected so that you can put some of your money into the bonus system and increase the premiums that authors get for publishing in open access journals. And uh, similar models can be put in place for many other forms of valuable content production beyond entertainment. The other distortion that I think much of society now resents on the internet globally outside the, uh, the, the, the high industrial content production, and I will finish with, on that note, uh, is that all the rules for in the, the spread of innovation and knowledge have been determined by the, what these societies perceive as incredible greed by intermediaries where only uh, a small bunch of authors actually reap these, the benefits of this uh, uh, very extended uh, copyright ownership. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, just pass on the microphone here, and when we'll continue. <coughs> uh, hello. Can you hear me? OK, I can barely hear myself. Uh, I won't introduce myself, for possibly for the fear of incriminating myself. Um, I believe this is Chatham House rules, or possibly, so don't attribute this to me. But um, I, I'm a PhD student, and um, before I had access to my university library, which had to do with not, not, not having paid the fees yet, um, I had no access to academic journals. Right now, I still have quite limited access to academic journals, and uh, I would not be able to do my PhD th thesis if it was not for huge amounts of piracy. So, yes, I, I do that. Um, secondly, I, I think that we uh, have not discussed uh, the human rights effects of copyright enforcement. Um, and to the, to the white paper, I would um, add some restrictions or regulations on copyright enforcement that is enforced by uh, you bots, robots, computers. Um, I'm, I'm referring to the sensor bots that... Um, cut off things like the Democratic Convention live stream. Um, and yeah, so I think what's, what's missing here is the, the, the human rights aspect and, and particularly freedom of expression and association and what effect copyright enforcement has there. And I also think an emerging two which should be discussed at this IGF is, is what role automatic enforcement plays and how can we regulate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I think there are a couple of uh, participants trying to get the microphone. Maybe you can pass it on. That would be great. Thanks. I can't hear you. Just off. Oh, yes, now it goes. Well, my name is Anawak. I'm from Brazil. I'm from the free software movement over there. And uh, I just want, want to do a little statement very fast. Uh, in the opening, when you talk about research and participation, uh, what was so funny about his, his refusing to talk in your uh, AGF uh, proprietary system uh, software? 
Uh, uh, this was a little Sorry, about respect. Can you move the microphone? Yeah, I can't stand no, up. No, no, no. Move the so. microphone away from your mouth. I think <coughs> what's happening is you're overloading okay. the microphone. In the opening, when you talk about Stalin participation, you were laughing when he refused to wait, wait, talk. Uh, no, move the microphone away from your mouth okay. because this you're overloading is, the signal. This is good now? Yeah, uh, yeah a little okay. further. I will try again. Right in the start of this uh, workshop, when you talk about Stallman participation and he's refusing to use your IGF proprietary software, uh, you all laugh. Uh, this is doesn't make sense that Mr. Stallman doesn't want to use free software or proprietary software. Uh, I believe that uh, Mr. Stallman and all free software defendants deserve a little more respect from this workshop. Just you to know. Um, thank you very much. But it, it, in fact, I was doing the, the opposite thing. I really, do I really do respect Richard Stallman and his uh, approach, straight approach to uh, just using free software as I do. Um, so we hopefully can get him on the line uh, again because um, I really think that uh, just using free software as I do um, should be, as you just mentioned, be respected more. The next participant, yeah. So the microphone is on the way to you. Interesting. On does not actually mean on all the time. OK. Um, uh, my name is Nick Ashton Hart. I'm with the Computer and Communications Industry Association. Um, but I also served as a music manager of very successful musical artists over a 25-year period. So. Hopefully my comments are reflective of uh, what I have seen in, as somebody who has personally made deals in the copyright system over a 25-year period. I'm pretty well acquainted of who it works for and who it doesn't work for um, and who it should work for. And what I would say is, at a practical level, I don't think you have to change the Berne Convention to create and create a registration obligation in order to get the ends that you seek. And, and I'll tell you why. In Scandinavia, people used to laugh because they implemented a system called extended collective management, which I'm sure is an incredibly dry term to everyone, including myself. Um, but what it basically means is the default, if you are willing to pay the going rate for a given piece of music, the default is yes, you can do that. You pay it to a central administration, and you can use whatever you want. This has been borne out to work because not accidentally, the great streaming services that we now have, uh, Pandora most notably, started in Scandinavia because of that system. If the default is that you can't use a piece of software or music, music in particular, you have to run around asking everyone who owns the rights in it for permission before you can do anything. All you're guaranteeing is that most people in the world won't get paid because it's not economic to go to a small country and find all the people who you, you, you can't find. There's no public registry, so you don't know who to ask, to license from. And the result of this is a lot of people don't get paid who could and who would be perfectly willing to let great services use their material, but they don't know who to talk to at those services, and the services don't know who, how to find them. So we're in a bizarre situation where the majority of the world's music and, and books is owned by somebody. The people who are willing to use it can't find them and so can't legally make it available. The, the idea of copyright was that creators are incentivized to create on the premise that this would result in the widest availability of cultural goods to the widest number of people. And that is not what we have. What we have is a system that returns the vast majority of the money to a tiny number of large companies. Now, I don't object to large companies. We have many large companies as members. But the point of copyright is not to serve shareholders of companies. It's fine if it does, incidentally. But it should. the first thing it should do is serve creators. And I can tell you, I get personal calls from some of the world's most successful music artists' management that they're receiving checks for the exploitation of their music on some of the most famous services in the world, not from the service, 
from the middleman, the service has to pay because the middleman owns the rights. And those checks for major territories and major services are so small, none of us could buy a cup of instant coffee with them. And I'm literally telling you, single digit dollars for an entire major market. So if we have a system where billions are being paid to rights holders and cup of coffee level checks are going to the world's most successful artists, we have a problem. We have a shared problem. And copyright owners should at a minimum be required to explain what they own to the rest of the world and allow people to access those rights at a reasonable medium of exchange. And so we don't really need to change copyright conventions to do this. Look to those successful models in countries which have applied innovation to the licensing of rights and borrow from, from the best. And let, by all means, let middlemen make as much money as they can. It would be nice if more than a tiny percentage of creators could actually make a living when we're done. It would be nice if this technological change actually resulted in creators making a living. I mean, it, literally, it's like 1% of musicians make a living. And I don't know of any other, right? 1% of people making a living? Would we tolerate 1% of teachers making a living? No. So why is that OK for musicians? And why is something like 5 or 6% for actors tolerable? None of us should, should find that acceptable. Thank you very much. I think it was a new point of view. Uh, went, went, wanted to add something to that point. Uh, actually, uh, it's Vince. I would like to ask a question. I'd uh, like Richard to ask Stallman a question, so uh, you need the microphone again. He's calling in. Um, what I didn't quite understand about the Scandinavian model was whether the uh, payments were fixed price or whether they were variable. And if they are fixed, uh, I'm not sure exactly why that works OK, although it's easy because it's, everybody knows what the numbers are. But I don't know if that is adequate compensation given the varying cost of production of some of the works. If it's a variable uh, cost, how does the party who wishes to pay find out what it is, how much is to be paid? Um. Well, there are, there are some good studies that have been done on this model, not surprisingly, uh, over the years. Um, in, in brief, basically, it's a negotiation between the, the collective management organization that controls the rights and the user and the service. But the difference here is you can get, you, you know negotiating with them that you've, you've got all the rights. They don't have to go and check with individual rights holders behind the society to see if the rate is OK, which ends up resulting in the, in the problem. And because the principle is everyone is opted in unless you opt out, rather than the other way around, it changes the dynamics between individual rights holders that are members of the society and, and the society itself, and the society's confidence in negotiating with, with the third parties. So in fact, the, va the rate varies based on what kind of service uh, that you're talking about. So, thank you very much. I think you should raise uh, the, the microphone, hand it over, please. And um, just to say, we had Richard Salmon again on the line. The next time he calls in, I'm just going to interrupt and then have him uh, online. Hi, um, my name is Susan Chalmers, and I'm the policy lead for Internet New Zealand. Um, I understand that this is a discussion on copyright principles, but I'd like to um, introduce uh, some thoughts on the conceptual framework behind copyright. Um, and so my, uh, my question will be directed um, at Mr. Serfant, the gentleman from the MPA. Um, the United States, New Zealand, and ten, nine other countries are currently negotiating a trade agreement called the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Within the Trans-Pacific Partnership is an intellectual property chapter, and within that intellectual property chapter is a copyright section. Um, the first provision within that copyright section would give um, copyright holders the right to authorize or prohibit temporary electronic copies. Um, the law in the United States is actually unsettled at this point. Um, Internet NZ is, is, is concerned about this provision um, 
for a number of reasons, but in the interest of avoiding a leading question, um, <laughs> I would like to invite um, Mr. Serve's reflection on the feasibility of the implementation of this right if it were broadly exercised. And I also like to invite the gentleman from the MPA to explain, because this provision is, I think, it's not uncouth anymore to say that it's motivated by um, the film and music industries. Um, I'd like to invite him to explain um, how he intends to exercise this right in the various free trade agreements uh, that in which it is found, which are about 13 at this point. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the short version of your question is, what were you thinking? Um, it sounds hard, depending on what the definition of temporary storage is, because the internet is made up of store and forward routers and intermediate devices that hold packets for varying periods of time. Uh, the packets contain the content. So if, uh, if there is some prohibition on storing things temporarily, anywhere in the internet. I honestly don't know how that would be enforced. In fact, I'm not even sure I understand how the internet would work, given the fundamental nature of store and forward networking, which is you store something for a while and then you get rid of it uh, to move it to its destination. So I, I don't have detailed knowledge of the either the TTP, TPP language nor the theory behind it. But So I'm responding in a very surface way, and I want everyone to understand that. But my first reaction is I would not know how to uh, enforce such a thing or even design such a thing uh, given the current way in which the internet is architected. Chris, got it. Okay. Um, I'm not familiar with the provision, but I, I do know that uh, we would not be looking for some sort of a right that would uh, make it impossible for the internet to function and for, trend, for, for the internet to, to deal with these temporary packets and so forth. So that cannot be the, the objective. There are uh, temporary copy exceptions that are provided in, in laws in other countries. Uh, all temporary copy uh, exceptions need uh, to meet the limitations on, on the temporary cop copying and they shouldn't be used as a pretext for uh, interfering with commercial exploitation of works, but certainly copies that are necessary to the functioning of something like the internet would be allowed. Um, now there, and, and I'll be happy to ask my colleagues who are more involved in that for more information, but I just cannot believe that the explanation given uh, by our colleague from New Zealand would be, uh, or the concern uh, would in fact um, be justified. I just, I think it require, I'll have to look into it. Uh, there have been a number of other points that have been made to which I'd like to respond. I don't know if now is the moment or if you want to wait until there's a further uh, discussion around the room. Uh, maybe, maybe we should continue with the multi-stakeholder approach and uh, we're, we're no, uh, there's no audience here. We are all participants of the workshop. So maybe we have time for one or two more. Um, yeah, maybe yeah, just start. Thank you. Um, my name is John Laprise. I'm a professor at Northwestern University in Qatar. And uh, I actually really appreciate Jeff's intervention uh, with the Gutenberg reference because I'm a historian of technology. And I wanted to further problematize this um, discussion by talking about um, two things. First of all, the changing nature of content, whereas 100 years ago, most content had was sole authored. Today, content has is much more likely of multiple authors, and how does that affect how we inter how we deal with copyright? Um, also, uh, globalization this is not strictly an internet issue, but it, it's, it plays in. You know, buying a song for a dollar in the U.S. is not the same as buying a song for a dollar in Uganda, and yet you can do the same thing. There's definite economic um, arbitrage um, problems in the system as it stands now. Um, on a final note, I just want to add a little bit more historical reference that copyright is literally about originally in early England about protecting distrib or, um, distributor rights. It's about literally the right of copying a work by printers in a given city and who has the rights to do that. So at its very foundation, it's about distribution rights. It's not about protecting authors. Thanks. Okay. 
Sorry, it's Vin. I wanted to add the small little codicil to that. The uh, original uh, British arrangement was crown copyright in order to protect the monarchy from having works published that were harmful to the monarchy. Uh, so you're quite correct that the view was quite different from what it has become today. You're right. So we had another, yeah, just, do, do you have a, the microphone? Great, yeah. start. Mm -hmm. um, hi, I'm, my name is Claudio Ruiz uh, and I'm from uh, Digital Rights in Chile. And um, it's just a very brief comment uh, about the very interesting uh, remarks that has been ma made. But one of the things uh, that I really uh, highlight, want to highlight about this uh, this topic is about the evidence. Uh, one of the things that I've been uh, talked about has been about the ev evidence. One of the evidence that, that, I ha that I have, it's the uh, copyright is uh, on crisis. And it's a huge crisis on copyright. And this crisis is because, uh, of course, of the emergency of the internet, as all we uh, know. But it's uh, uh, very, very important to just add about the importance of the growing of interna international agreements, as Susan has said, as TPP, as ACTA has said, which the only, uh, the only point that I wanted to make is just to grow all the copyright scope. Uh, besides of the fact of the right balance between the interest uh, of the copyright owner from one side, but the public from the other. So the effects that uh, that, that uh, international agreements has made, um, it's about the public domain. Uh, it's very, very complicated from the point of view of the public domain, orphan works and so on. And uh, and one of the, the other objectives at all these uh, international agreements has been in, ma in mind it's about lowering the scope of exceptions and limitations on, on, on copyright. So I think the evidence, or if we wanted to think about a white paper on copyright, the first thing that we really want to address is about the evidence. And this is not what I thought, it's about the Hargraves report has made in the, several, in the last year, so it's very important. And the second point, it's maybe, it's just uh, one idea to put it on the table, and that's maybe, it would be interesting to just think about um, how can we think about a, a different copyright for different kind of works? Today, the copyright uh, applies also for software at the same time from academic works. So maybe uh, uh, one starting point is to start, uh, you know, not just on the uh, from the um, from our our um, copyright scope, but maybe t start to think more about the way that. We lost the last sentence, so maybe Sorry? we lost the last sentence. Oh, uh, it's about the difference between uh, we have now uh, the copyright applies also for software and uh, academic works and so on. So maybe it will be a very starting point to just start to thinking about a different kind of protection uh, with different kind of, uh, of copyright. So we have one more uh, participant. Oh, well, several more. Sorry, but uh, I'd like just pass on the microphone this, this direction. Thank you. And maybe you can make it sh quick because we just have 10 minutes left and I want to make a final round. Okay, that's fine. Um, basically, I wanted to um, comment on what um, Trevor was saying about young people and copyright. I'm here as, um, with uh, the Web of Tomorrow is yours and um, youth. And basically, I asked some people at my college, which is a non-formal education college in Denmark, um, where students are in their 20s about copyright and I was quite surprised actually like most of them do care about copyright a lot of them were saying that they think copyright la rights should last forever which was um, not what I expected to hear actually um, and they said that they care about copyright in relation to stuff that they're creating their photos they like people to reference them they don't want other people to take credit for what they have created but it's okay to use what they've made for free so long as they're accredited. That copyright is important to tool to restrict people from accessing and stealing, stealing your hard work in the straight of photos and information and their research papers. That they don't like thief. They don't like people stealing their work. But that they're not necessarily worried about money. They're worried about accreditation. They also care about referencing and acknowledging the author. But they can't access things that they need for their studies. So they don't like that when they do a research paper, they can't access the information that they need. So when you work on a project, you, you care about it, but it limits you. And I think that's basically what I, what I have to contribute. 
Thank you very much. So we've got one last, two last. Could you please ha pass on the, the microphone because I can't do it. <laughs> Throw it. <laughs> no, don't, no, don't. Um, in the meantime, I let you know that um, the, um, we lost uh, Jeff Jarvis and Richard Stallman because the whole system um, crashed. We should have used maybe free software for that. Can you hear me? Okay. My name is Carl Schonander. I work for the, U the United States government, the Department of State, the Office of Intellectual Property Enforcement. I just wanted to mention a couple of things. Uh, to the gentleman who talked about being uh, talked about copyright being in crisis. Um, I'd just like to refer people to a de U.S. Department of Commerce study which came out about six months ago which talks about the contribution of copyright industries and other IP intensive industries to the economy. Now you can agree or disagree with the methodology in that report but it is the first uh, report that my government at any rate has put out on this topic and I think it is worthwhile reflecting on and can make a contribution to this white paper report that you were talking about. WIPO has also come out with some very interesting studies on the uh, contribution of copyright intensive industries to the economy. So um, I, I would just uh, let ask people to think about that. Um, the other thing is people have talked a lot about the multi-stakeholder approach. We haven't talked a lot today about voluntary best practices agreements, but there's some interesting ones that have uh, come up in the United States, for example, the uh, Copyright Information Center, uh, which is hopefully going to get up and running soon. And there are other examples as well that President Obama's uh, Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator has been working with, with the private sector, uh, to make happen. There's a lot of other things I could say, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, hand over to, to your back. Yeah, it's your, So, and you're the last one, and you're yeah, you. Uh, Hi, am I heard? So, my name is Amelia Andersdotter. I'm a member of the European Parliament on behalf of the Swedish Pirate Party. Um, I agree that there is a crisis in copyright globally, but I don't think that this is so much because of, of the uh, internet coming into society as that we very prematurely harmonized many regulatory frameworks at an international level for how we deal with culture and communication before we'd actually had the discussion at the level of the people who want to communicate about culture, that is like you or we as private persons in society. And because we don't have a regulatory framework, which at all is in line with how people normally see themselves as interacting with, with culture or communication, of course we're ending up with a lot of problems, not only online, but also for libraries, for public broadcasters, or in terms of the Danish students. I would say that they're not actually, they don't like copyright. They like attribution, and copyright is not about attribution as much as it is about money. So they, they also don't, don't um, agree with, with this. And I think what, what we're lacking primarily in international debates now is a political resolve to change those international regulatory frameworks. It is not difficult for a legislator to change the law. I work in a parliament, we change the law every day. But we lack a political resolve. And instead we're saying, let the industry decide what values we will impose on our private communications as citizens. No, actually, let's not do that. This is the responsibility of us as a community to decide under what forms we want to build our own communities. And we cannot leave this to an industry coalition or to, for somebody else to, to decide uh, in that way, based on a monopoly right granted by the government nonetheless. Uh, I come from Scandinavia, so I know about the extended collective licenses. In general, I would say that you're right, but we're seeing a problem in Sweden at least, that the collecting agencies that previously used to defend very specific groups of actors like uh, sculpture makers or uh, music performing mutis, music artists and, and act, actors all had separate organizations, now they're in the same. So their political leverage in dealing with the monopoly rights granted by the government is now very much stronger in relation to everyone else, and in particular, new and creative distribution models. So that is turning into maybe also a blockage. I think if you try to deploy that on a larger level, like we're discussing collective rights management in Europe now also, um, Sweden does not have a lot of problems with, say, institutional corruption. But if you look at the recent SK scandal in, in Spain, 
you might not want to give them a lot of money for, for rights that they're not sure if they're controlling or not. So ECLs, definitely a good idea, but you need to be yeah, you need to be very cautious about the implementation because otherwise you, you can end up with very large mismanagement of funds also. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, I'll be um, opening the final round. Um, Chris, you may want to start. Thanks. Yeah, since I'm in a, minor in a real minority here, I think I ought to say a few things. Uh, the the uh, several points have been made. On human rights and enforcement, I think that that is something that we are all extremely mindful of in, in terms of enforcement. Uh, we take uh, all available steps to try to make sure that privacy rights are protected. Uh, and any, any uh, actions against, and that, that are, there I'm talking about individuals, anything dealing with uh, profit-making sites uh, that are substantially devoted to piracy uh, those also are protected. Uh, free, the freedom of expression rights are protected. Those are weighed up in the courts before action is taken against them. I think enforcement uh, is working. I wouldn't be as desperate about the situation as, as some who commented on the, 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 the levels of theft. They are great. They need to be contained. Uh, it's part of a wider issue of responsibility and, and society. Uh, and so that needs to be taken into account. Um, companies that make money uh, reinvest that money in further creative works. Uh, I see nothing particularly wrong about that, nor is there a need to be uh, defensive about it. I think it's a, it's a good thing. The, that money is, at least in the system that I'm familiar with uh, and in many European systems, shared with the participants in the work, and then they get to work again uh, in the next work, which is useful these days when we're looking for jobs. Uh, I think that um, on, on the issue of whether there's a crisis or not, the jury is, is truly out on that. I, citing Hargreaves, and I'll, you know, Hargreaves was in the UK called the Google Report, uh, so I'll defer to my colleague from Google whether he thinks that the, you know, Hargreaves points to fundamental flaws in copyright or not, uh, but it was a US, UK government-sponsored report uh, that had the backing, uh, apparently, of, uh, of certain companies, but that, you know, it, we were involved in it as well, and we think that the report itself failed to make the case uh, based on evidence that change, fundamental changes are needed. Yes, some areas of work were identified, for example, uh, registers. Uh, so, um, you know, th th no one is claiming that the system is perfect. There are, there are adjustments that uh, presumably are needed, and the whole issue of Extended collective licensing, it can work in particular contexts. I think if you try to generalize that, uh, you, need, you, you run into troubles. It works in a Scandinavian context. Uh, collection societies have, have a certain role. There's a certain acceptance there. Uh, and there is the opt-out uh, opt pr provision. In terms of collective management, I'm not a defender of the system. I think that it, it, it should be limited. Um, and I think that also collect in collective management organizations should abide by rules and, and transparency requirements um, that would give them greater credibility in doing the work that uh, societies and parliaments decide they would need to do. Uh, so I, I, I'll stop there. There are so many other points that were made that I would like to be able to address, but I'm afraid I would use all of the rest of the time. The rest of the time is exactly zero, so we have to hurry up a little bit. Um, <laughs> Mr. Emanuel, please. Uh, I think uh, that there is no actually a clash between, uh, between internet and the copyright. Uh, uh, the, the main uh, idea is to find harmony between them two and uh, the aim today for us is uh, um, together with uh, tightening in a way uh, legislation, uh, copyright legislation, to find measures uh, for uh, compulsory or uh, obligatory uh, licensing uh, that are to be taken in the future. Thank you very much. So. Um, uh, Mr. Clark, maybe you want to continue? 
Well, uh, in the interest of time, I could say thank you and <coughs> thank all of the the stakeholders that have made their contributions. Uh, I think these exercises are valuable. Um, I got to thank Nick once again for putting the cards plainly on the table. This challenge of the middlemen in music is something that the industry has to address. What we are doing is working with developing countries to get them to understand the need to improve the transparency and accountability and generally the good governance for the things that they do. Um, it's amazing that you start in the, in the garage collecting a couple hundreds of dollars and everything is fine. But by the time the collections get into the hundreds of thousands or the millions, then all hell breaks loose. And there's evidence of an increasing number of collecting societies that have fallen into this trap. So the, the need for transparency and, and good governance is, is very important. And as I said, we're working with um, developing countries uh, on this. On the other question of the, the foundations of, of, of copyright, somebody mentioned 1917. 09 or 1710, the statute of N, and, but the foundation for copyright in this statute is, and I quote, for the encouragement of learning. And I'm very disappointed to hear that my student colleague at the back, who I didn't look back to see because he, he, he wants to remain anonymous um, because he is copying. I'm, I'm very disappointed and, and, and sad, you know, to hear that a student has to go to such extent of illegal copying, etc., in order to add to this learning that the foundation of copyright was prepared for. So I hope that through these discussions and others like these that we can find a way to simplify this environment and to make it more flexible, more user-friendly, remembering that the creators need to be paid, but there are users that who need to get access. Thank you very much. So uh, when you're, you're the last, unless we don't have Jeff or uh, Richard on, online. No, we don't. Well, thank you very much. I certainly enjoyed this exchange. And I've come away with uh, some ideas that I didn't expect to, uh, to uh, have. First of all, uh, given the title, Copyright and Internet Clash of Interests, one thing that you should keep in mind is that the World Wide Web, which is not the Internet, but one of the biggest applications on the Internet, is a giant copying engine. That's how it works. Your browser goes, pulls a file, copies it, interprets it, presents it to you. So uh, if copyright is the fundamental notion of protection uh, for intellectual property and works, maybe we have a real problem here, and we should be rethinking what it is we're trying to accomplish. I think what we're trying to do is to establish a reward system which is satisfactory to the creators of these works. Not all of them want remuneration, some do, many want credit. Uh, so let's focus on the outcome that we're interested in. I think maybe the prevention of copying may not be the right thing anymore given the fundamentals of digital uh, content. The second observation I'd make is that once you digitize something, you need a piece of software in order to interpret it. And if that software isn't available, or doesn't work anymore, then the bag of bits that you got, however you got them, you know, legally or illegally, is no longer of any use at all. There may be some seeds of ideas hiding in here to allow us to re-examine what it is we're all about, given the current state of technology today. Thank you very much. Um, thank you all. Um, what have we written on that white pe uh, sheet of paper today? Um, one interesting uh, uh, idea you just mentioned is, is the copyright, the right to copy, uh, the right approach, or is it the right of the author? Which, if, for example, in the German right is called the Urheberrecht, which is the right of the author. It doesn't work either, but um, that's one of the questions we had today is, does the whole thing work, or is it in a total crisis? We weren't, well, well it was quite controversial, that issue. Um, we had the idea of the Gutenberg era, era that um, well, every content which was uh, on a physical layer, and that's the business model, is selling the physical layer. But is that business model dead? I think so it is. Um, we had the idea that the, what, what's the outcome? What we want to achieve is um, a fair, you, a fair um, well, we're coming together of the author and the user. And what about the man in the middle? 
what are we going to do with them? Do they need them anymore? Is there uh, any use of them? Um, one thing is obvious, um, and I think that's uh, where we all agree on, is this is a, um, an issue we can't deal on a national basis. It, it won't work anymore, and the globalization, the best thing about globalization, the internet, um, and as me being a member of a national parliament, I had to uh, accept that I lost control over these, uh, these things. I can't make laws that will work worldwide. So this was my motivation to start the discussion on a multi-stakeholder international approach like we did here at the IGF. I think the IGF is one of the places where we should discuss, discuss with this issue. And um, we won't have an outcome today with a perfect solution. I think it'll take years, maybe decades, to find the perfect, perfect uh, idea of an, um, how to deal with intellectual property in the future of the digital world. Thank you very much and have a nice IGF. Thanks.